Good, good morning, everyone. Um, um, Really um, welcome to the PCORI annual meeting. I'm um, Christine Gertz. I'm the vice chair of the of the um, PCORI board and have the honor of being the the chair of this this really important session this morning. As as you all know, our country is facing a um, unprecedented crisis with opioids. There are a lot of ways to. Um, to, to look at, at that crisis, and, and PCORI has a, a full portfolio of approximately $100 million looking at that. Last year, we focused on non-pharmacological treatments for, um, for pain and, and how it might help address the opioid crisis, and this year, we're looking more at, at medication-assisted treatment and, and other related um, therapies. So we really appreciate your, your time and, and interest um, in, in um, addition to being on the Board of Governors, my, my day job is I have a 25-year career doing patient-centered comparative effectiveness research, primarily looking at non-pharmacological treatments for, um, for chronic pain. I'm the chief executive officer of, of a nonprofit called the Spine Institute for Quality, and I'm currently conducting um, several NIH and DOD-funded study comparative effectiveness trials, again, looking at um, conservative treatments treatments for, um, for chronic and acute low back pain. It is my um, pleasure, what I'm going to be doing here is each, each speaker as they, as they come up are, is going to be loading their, their slides and so I'm going to introduce each person while they're, while they're loading their, their slides. And, and our, our, first, um, our first speaker today is, is my co-chair, who and um, Dr. Els um, Hutzmuller, who is an Associate Director of Healthcare Delivery and Disparities Program here at PCORI. Prior to joining PCORI, she was Managing Editor of Health Technology Assessments at Hayes Incorporated, and before that, she was an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she served as Principal Investigator on several research grants and directed a human subjects research laboratory focused on drugs of abuse and addiction, including opioids. Her work has been published in numerous peer-reviewed papers, book chapters, and health technology assessments. At PCORI, she is also in charge of several PCORI funding announcements focused on treatment of opioid use disorder. She also serves as chair of an IRB for a small research group in Baltimore. Welcome, Els. So how is everyone enjoying the meeting so far? Good, good. One of the, we're, we're having the speakers um, um, present on this panel, but then we'll, at the end we'll also have two discussants and we will, um, and then we'll be opening it up for questions and, and we're lo really looking forward to hearing what all of you have to say as we're um, during that discussion portion of, of this session. So somebody told me not too long ago that, you know, it used to be that the, the most common lie in the world was the check was mailed yesterday, and now it's, this was just working a minute ago. <laughs> I swear that we thought her slides were loaded, and they were just working a minute ago. All right. I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. It's now in slideshow? Okay. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Christine. Thank you all for being here. Um, I don't need to repeat anything about the incredible importance of this topic given uh, the opioid epidemic and the, the many, many challenges it fa we face with it. Um, let's see if this works. I have nothing to disclose. 
What I want to do is just very briefly give you an overview of the PCORI portfolio in the area of opioids. And we really have um, uh, thought about it in, in a number of ways, addressing it from different angles, and that's what I want to briefly show you. So as of um, actually yesterday, October, um, PCORI has awarded $88 million to fund 16 comparative effectiveness studies. And uh, there are approximately 170,000 patients involved in these studies. Now this includes active participants in research studies who are having visits and, and being tracked, but also patients who have consented to have their administrative health data used in research. <clears throat> so when we started um, funding opioid studies, we really wanted to make sure that we addressed um, the research needs in across the whole care continuum. And so that includes prevention of unsafe prescribing, um, alternative treatments, non-opioid treatment options for pain, because we know, all know by now, I think, that um, some part, a large part of this epidemic resulted from um, well-intentioned prescriptions of uh, opioids for pain. Also, the management of long-term prescription opioid use. Um, and finally, the treatment of opioid use disorder. So this just lists um, the number of targeted funding announcements that we've put out in the past couple of years. We started with strategies to prevent unsafe opioid prescribing in primary care that was focused um, primarily on patients who had not yet been prescribed opioids. Uh, we then had a, a funding announcement for clinical strategies for managing and reducing long-term opioid use for chronic pain. So for those patients who have been taking opioids and, and are on, uh, often on high doses. And in the last two years, um, as Christine also mentioned, we have really focused on treatment of opioid use disorder. We had one funding announcement that uh, focused specifically on pregnant women and their infants. And then the most recent one that was released this year uh, focuses on comparative effectiveness of different psychosocial interventions that are part of medication-assisted treatment. So I want to just give you a sense of, of the number of studies and, and that we focused in these of the... What happened? Oh. <laughs> in each of these areas. So the first one is prevention of unsafe prescribing. Um, and we have, I've listed here, and I don't expect you to read through every title of every study that we funded in this area, but I just want to give you a, a sense of the studies that are um, currently funded and producing results in this area. Um, so they include naturalistic experiments, they include um, interventions uh, focused on provider behavior and also interventions focused on patient behavior. The next sort of bucket uh, that we think about in terms of funding studies is the non-opioid treatment options for pain. And in that one, we have funded um, a number of studies. And uh, the, the ones, we actually have a lot more studies that, that address pain, but the ones that address pain in patients that um, are receiving or would otherwise receive opioids are listed here. Um, and the first study I do want you to take a look at because we have, um, as a speaker, the PI on that study, um, Beth Darnall, who is here. And she will be speaking about a study that has uh, a component that is the comparative effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, comparing that to chronic pain self-management. But the aspect that she's going to talk about specifically today is the context in which these interventions are being compared, which is opioid reduction for patients. The third bucket is the management of long-term prescription opioid use. So those are the patients who have been taking op prescription opioids for pain. And here you see a list of the uh, different studies that we've funded in that area. And the one that I would like you to pay particular attention to today 
is um, a study looking at prescription opioid management in chronic pain patients that looked at a patient-centered activation intervention because our, uh, one of our speakers today, Monique Doves, is going to talk about the patient activation and patient engagement parts of that study. Finally, the treatments for opioid use disorder. Uh, we funded a number of studies. Some of them are, the bottom two here are focused on pregnant women, um, but, the, but the first three are really focused on different populations. The first one is um, uh, prisoners who are uh, getting released from, uh, from prison. Uh, so before re-entry, they're treated. Uh, the second one is a, is a one that I would like you to pay particular attention to again, because we have David Gastfriend here who will talk about the trial that he is running <clears throat> that looks at um, offering medication-assisted treatment and a number of psychosocial interventions in FQHCs specifically. And that was, um, so that gives you a quick, broad overview of the PCORI portfolio. And without saying anything more, I want to give the floor to our actual investigators. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. As, um, as she um, uploads her slides, I'd like to introduce the, the first of our, our three panelists, um, Dr. Beth Darnall. So Dr. Donnell is a principal investigator for National Pain and Opioid Reduction Research Projects with a collective funding of $13 million. Her work focuses on developing, investigating, and disseminating scalable and effective treatments to reduce pain and opioid use. In 2018, Darnell's disseminating uh, community-based patient-centered opioid tapering research was published in JAMA Internal Medicine and received a National Research Award. She leads a PCORI-funded study on compassionate patient-centered opioid ta ta tapering and comparative effectiveness of self-management and psychological treatment for chronic pain. Darnall has authored three books and spoke on the psychology of pain relief at the 2018 World Economic Forum. She has also been featured in Scientific American, The Washington Post, on BBC Radio, and in Nature. Welcome, Dr. Darnall. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, so these are my disclosures, my funding both from PCORI and from the NIH, as well as some uh, consulting. Um, as was mentioned, I have authored books for patients, also for clinicians, and um, am focused on training healthcare clinicians about how to best treat pain. I'll move through this very quickly. Um, in a fortuitous stroke of luck and fortune, um, my op-ed on patient-centeredness as a critical pathway to address the dual crises of pain and opioids published last night in uh, The Hill. And I just wanted to give a public shout out to Christine Stencil for her support and uh, assistance with getting this out. Um, this is a very timely topic, as you all know, um, most recent data suggests that up to 100 million Americans are living with ongoing pain of some type. This is roughly one in three individuals. Um, and this is true worldwide. Now, pain touches all of our lives. Many of us in this room probably are living with pain, but if you are not personally, you probably have a family member or loved one who does. We want to focus on how we're treating pain. Historically, over the past 15 years, it has been an over-focus on prescribing opioids to treat pain, such that currently, roughly 5.5% of the U.S. population, or almost 18 million Americans, are taking long-term prescription opioids right now. And this is problematic. Um, Although some people definitely need prescription opioids to be one part of their care plan, this overemphasis has conferred risks to certain patients. And you've all heard about um, mortality related to prescription opioids. While this is largely fueled by illicit opioid use, this has conferred risks and even mortality to patients who are taking their uh, opioids, their medically prescribed opioids. So the question is, how do we treat pain best and how do we help keep our patients safe. So there has been increasing focus on uh, non-pharmacological pathways to address pain and also as a pathway to uh, mitigate this overfocus on prescription opioids. Now, it's not just about opioids 
or no opioids, this binary reductive focus. Ultimately, we want to help our patients live better with complex medical conditions, with the pain that they have. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. Now, multiple national agencies, such as the Institute of Medicine, the NIH, the CDC, have, and even PCORI, have called for the better integration of evidence-based psychological and self-management strategies as a pathway to help people better manage pain and ideally reduce reliance on a purely pill-based approach. Now, this dovetails with what we know about how pain is best treated using a biopsychosocial treatment approach. Um, and this is really at the core of patient-centeredness, where we're fundamentally treating the person who has pain, not just the reductive symptom of pain. But this hasn't always been the case, even though we've known that the biopsychosocial model of pain treatment is superior, we have, over the past decades, been overly focused on a biomedical approach that fails to both characterize and attend to the individual needs of each patient. When we take a look at the actual definition of pain, what we see is that there is the person in the definition. This is a definition from the International Association for the Study of Pain. Pain is defined as both a negative sensory and emotional experience. It's fundamentally a psychosocial um, experience or psychosensory experience that includes the psychology of the individual, but we don't often treat it that way. Again, we tend to emphasize a biomedical reductive model that actually supports um, prescribing as the main emphasis. If we think about pain, I, I like to describe pain as our harm alarm. It's designed to get our attention to alert us that there's danger or a threat that is afoot and that we must attend to it and it motivates us to escape whatever is causing the pain because that's a potential threat to our survival. And it works really well if you place your hand on a hot stove, you're gonna feel that sensation, you're gonna be motivated and prepared to escape the cause of the pain. But what happens when we have migraines or fibromyalgia or ongoing low back pain or sickle cell disease pain or any of the numerous pain conditions that people are living with today, real world patients, when that harm alarm rings and that motivation to escape pain comes into play, you can't readily escape pain that's coming from inside of you. And so this creates a tension and it creates a lot of distress for people who are living with pain. Because we're all born with the motivation to escape pain, but we are not born with the understanding of how to modulate pain, the distress that it causes us, and how it alters our lives. But this can be learned, and this is really the realm of pain psychology and self-management, where we teach individuals information and skills so that they become equipped to best manage their own pain and symptoms, not necessarily to the exclusion of medication, but this is critical foundational information that helps them live better. So cognitive behavioral therapy for pain is typically comprised of a whole host of different topics and skills that patients um, acquire over the course of up to eight weeks of treatment. And this is true for the chronic pain self-management program too, which uses, um, really applies many of these same principles and information, but the chronic pain self-management program is um, typically delivered by two trained peers, people with lived experience, whereas CBT is typically delivered by by psychologists. So now what we want to do is take what we know about these evidence-based treatments for pain and begin to think about how we can apply them to facilitate opioid reduction. Now this is a topic that's fraught with complications and fears. If you ask patients what's their number one concern about reducing their opioids, they're gonna say pain. They're worried about having pain and that's a legitimate concern. They're also concerned about having withdrawal symptoms. I'm talking about people who are taking daily prescribed opioids. And some of this fear is born from personal experience because if you're taking opioids regularly on a daily basis, 
If you miss a dose of medication, or you, know, you, you forgot your prescription at home, or maybe you tried to taper your opioids on your own um, and, and uh, stopped the medication too quickly, you're gonna experience withdrawal symptoms, including increased pain. But when we take a look at the data around opioid uh, reduction, we see that when opioids are reduced the right way, that pain doesn't actually increase. In fact, pain improves on average. Now, this isn't to say everybody will have reductions in pain, but on average, pain improves with opioid reduction. But the key here is that they're being reduced the right way in costly inpatient programs. So the question is, how do we scale a program for community-based outpatients? Because almost none of the patients that we know are going to be able to access these costly inpatient programs. So as a prequel to um, my funded PCORI project, we conducted a study in community outpatients um, taking prescription opioids and invited them to participate in a patient-centered opioid tapering program. This was voluntary and we did not um, we did not request that patients taper to zero. Rather, we asked them to partner with their doctor and reduce their opioids to the lowest comfortable dose over a four-month study period. We invited 110 patients to participate, 68 accepted, and 51 uh, completed our program. There was only one variable that distinguished completers from non-completers, and that was depression. Um, so these are the variables. This is our sample char characteristics. You can see that people have been on opioids six years, and the median, uh, the morphine equivalent daily dose was almost 300 milligrams. So this is a real-world sample. And what we found was that over the course of the four-month study period, people cut their opioid uh, doses by about in half. And here are the actual data. Each uh, point is an individual patient. And what you can see is that the initial opioid dose did not predict taper response, which means that our data suggests that we have a formula that can help patients that are even on high-dose opioids. And here's the really important slide, their pain did not increase on average. You see a couple of dots up there, and that really stands as a testament to our need to be patient-centered in the application of these approaches. But if you look at the data as an absolute change and morphine equivalent, pain actually improved as people reduced their opioids. But again, we want to help people live better, not just reduce their opioids. And this is the comparative effectiveness study that we are conducting right now. Um, this is funded by PCORI. This is the EMPOWER study, Effective Management of Pain and Opioid-Free Ways to Enhance Relief. The logo and the branding of this study were, was uh, created and supported by patient advisors. We are studying almost 1,400 patients taking long-term opioids for chronic pain in four states, seven different clinics. And we are carefully selecting the patients who enter our study to make sure that this tapering program is right for them and we monitor them very closely to make sure we are attending to any discomfort and symptoms that may arise. Everybody who comes into our study engages in a voluntary patient-centered opioid tapering program, and then they're randomized to either eight weeks of CBT, six weeks of the chronic pain self-management program, or just the taper only. And we hypothesize that these uh, behavioral pain medicine classes will optimize patient response to the taper. I want to emphasize that a critical portion of our study is training physicians and in how to partner with their patients in a patient-centered way. This is a pragmatic study, which means that we're going into seven different clinics and we're fundamentally altering clinical care, and then we're studying the results of that. So really paying close attention to the doctor-patient relationship and equipping physicians and prescribers with the skills to conduct patient-centered pain medicine and opioid reduction is a critical element. Um, so uh, I just wanted to mention our study is now live. So you can go to the Empower, uh, you can go to um, empower.stanford.edu if you'd like to see our website. We utilize um, the voices of patients with successful lived experience with opioid tapering as a critical element of engaging patients, their interest and their willingness to join the Empower study. I just want to give a shout out to all of my colleagues and collaborators that I work with. Um, here is the study website if you have interest in learning more. And with that, I will say thank you for your attention.
Great, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna invite our next speaker to go up and, and load her slides. Um, Ms. Monique does, has more than 20 years of experience managing, managing multi-site observational studies, behavioral interventions, and clinical trials. Her current research interests include chronic pain, prescription opioid use, patient-reported outcomes, and med medical cannabis use. She currently manages studies on opioid use and addiction at Kaiser Permanente North, Northern California's Division of Research, including a recently completed PCORI study of a behavioral intervention in primary care for patients on long-term prescription opioids. Her own experience with chronic pain and her positive experience with patient partners has led her to her sustained commitment in patient-centered research. Welcome. Thank you. First, I just want to say I'm very honored to be here. Um, being involved with this PCORI study has really changed my life, and I have, it has a positive experience, positive impact on the work that I do and my own personal life. So thank you, of course, to the panel, who, the PCORI staff who put together the panel. Um, so I'm a project manager at Kaiser Northern California in the Division of Research, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a study. As Els mentioned, this is one of the uh, a PCORI study that has been funded. The study is we're finished with data collection, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our results. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, for those of you who are, who are trying to get um, continuing education credits, I hope that by the end of the session you'll be able to talk about how one PCORI-funded <laughs> study addressed the needs for patient-centered research on treating chronic pain in primary care. Um, thank you, Beth, for such a wonderful overview of the opioid epidemic in the United States and the prescribing and some of the patient-centered work that you're doing. It was really wonderful. Um, I won't talk too much about, um, but I will say that, as we can see, opioid uh, prescriptions are declining nationally, and despite that, there's still a lot of concern over the high rates of abuse and overdose. And there's a lot of efforts to combat this, and one are local initiatives and health systems, and Kaiser is actually one of those. And um, an interesting sort of side note is that as we were beginning our study um, at the height of the epidemic in 2015, um, Kaiser had rolled out a big uh, safety initiative, which had some interesting challenges for the implementation of our study. Um, in addition, the CDC put out guidelines in 2016 that had a, an impact. And as you can see by this recent paper by Amy Bonehart that was just published last month, um, their results are coming in to show that the 2016 CDC guidelines are affecting opioid prescribing rates. Um, high dose rates, co-prescribing with benzos, diazepines, all of these rates are going down. And I wanted to highlight here in this paper in yellow the, the outcomes that they measured. Now, although that declining rates of opioid use are um, excellent for population health and policy, what do they say about the patient perspective, and how does that affect patients? Does declining opioid use necessarily good for the patients themselves? As Beth had indicated, a lot of patients you know, use opioids and need opioids to manage their pain. Um, the people in our study, on average, were um, living with chronic pain for over 15 years. So this is a substantial uh, impact on one's life quality. So I'm looking forward to seeing more studies that come out that show the effect on patients and patient-centered outcomes on some of these initiatives. Now I'm going to turn to some of the evidence gaps that, were, um, that we were facing um, five years ago. Now keep in mind this study that we were, we, we were um, designing it five years ago. So what might have been an evidence gap then might not necessarily be one now. Um, but we were really interested in looking at primary care, and we were noticing that there was a need for evidence-based research on patient-centered approaches for treating chronic pain in primary care. And why primary care? Um, mostly because the majority of prescriptions for opioids are, come from primary care, primary care doctors. And a lot of patients have an established relationship with their primary care doctor, so it's a good starting point to have a, to have a dialogue, to learn how to speak to your physician about your health care needs and your pain and your opioid use. Um, we found that a lot of patients didn't necessarily want to go to a multidisciplinary pain program. They didn't need one. There was stigma involved with that in some, in some health care systems. So we decided to focus on primary care. Um, we also decided to look at some of the self-management and education 
um, movements that were going on in other chronic health conditions, for example, diabetes and heart disease. There's a lot of movement towards engaging patients to take their own health care into the consideration. And so we wanted to see if we could apply that into the world of chronic pain. And lastly, we were interested in bringing a, the patient activation paradigm into the world of chronic pain and opioid prescribing. Um, and we based some of this work on a study that we did at the Division of Research called the Linkage Study, um, which was based in substance abuse treatment. And it was an activation intervention. It was six sessions designed at activating patients to get them to become more involved in their own health care. And it was based on Judith Hibbert's work. And the de de definition that she uses of patient activation is understanding one's role in the healthcare process and having the knowledge and the skills to manage one's own health. And so this was something that we were really interested in looking at. Does activating patients to become more involved in their health care around their pain and their opioid use, would it improve outcomes? So I'll talk a little bit about now about our study called the ACTIVATE study. And again, it was a patient-centered activation intervention based in, pri based in primary care. The principal investigator on the study was Cynthia Campbell. It was a randomized pragmatic trial, and pragmatic in the sense that we implemented in a primary care setting in a real-world setting. We had very little exclusion criteria other than being on opioids for three months. Um, we randomized um, 376 patients into a usual care arm and a behavioral intervention. And in addition to electronic health records, we looked at, we collected data via surveys at uh, baseline six months and 12 months. Now the intervention itself um, was brief. It was four 90-minute sessions. Um, and the goal of the interventions was to empower patients to take more an active role in their, not only their pain management, but their overall health. And the sessions were led by a psychologist, a pain psychologist, and were designed with input from patients. Excuse me. The sessions um, focused on three main things. One was non-pharmacological strategies for managing pain. So this was sort of a brief introduction to chiropractor, acupuncture, massage, and we had some hands-on activities in the interventions that were very engaging for the patients. Like we did guided imagery and we did mindfulness activities. We also focused on teaching people about the online uh, resources. Kaiser is really well known for its online portal called kp.org, and we had a lot of evidence to show that people were using kp.org, but they weren't necessarily using it to its full capacity. So we did hands-on activities where we showed people how to track their um, lab results and email their doctors and schedule appointments and things like that, as well as showed them a, a, a wealth of online resources on health and wellness. And we also focused on communication skills. As you can imagine, these are, there are a lot of difficult conversations that have to happen between a patient who is living with chronic pain on opioids, especially in this very stigmatized environment. So I just wanted to point out here again that the goal of the intervention wasn't necessarily to test um, self-management of care or to look at any particular thing. It was to try to see if we could activate patients and intervene upstream in primary care to get to, again, to get patients to be more involved in their health care. Um, real quick, a mention of our study team. Um, in addition to our 11 clinical stakeholders that we had, we had five patients that were involved in the study. And we recruited them very early on from pain programs throughout California. Um, and it was very imp a very important part of our study design to have this patient input from the very beginning. And here you could see their, their pictures. And it was particularly important because of the stigma and the marginalization to constantly have their input on every phase of the study. And here you could see we, we had them involved in the early concept of the study from recruitment activities to data collection all the way through dissemination. I do want to point out that one thing that we did that was a little unusual um, at the time is that we involved patients in the data analysis phase. And we thought this was really important as because we wanted them to, to be involved through the life of the project. And often there's a drop off with patient engagement towards the end phases of a study because it is hard to engage people with different education levels and different experiences. So we did a series of eight data lessons with our patients, learning, teaching them about statistical modeling and all sorts of things that would enable them to feel more comfortable. And this was a very worthwhile and, and, and enriching experience for everyone that I'm happy to speak with more at the end with anybody who's interested. 
So a little bit about our results. Again, we randomized 376 patients and we looked at outcomes at six months and 12 months. And although we did see a decline overall in pain severity and opioid use over the course of the study, we didn't see a significant difference in those two outcomes between the two arms, between the usual care arm and the intervention arm. However, we did note with regard to some important patient-centered outcomes, we did note that the patients, participants in the intervention did have overall higher health scores, lower depression scores, and higher function scores. And by function, I mean the ability to engage in your normal activities, social activities, climbing scares, going to grocery shopping, things like this. And these outcomes, um, a lot of them we use the promise measures, but these were all outcomes that were developed by our patients as being patient-centered as to what really mattered to the patients. So of course pain of, is important, but also what matters is the ability to live your daily life. Um, in addition, we also noticed an increased um, use of the online portal, particularly with the health and wellness resources available, and an increased use of self-management um, skills, particularly mindful, mindfulness and meditation. So, in summary, what we showed was that an increase, there was, as a result of the intervention and participation in the intervention, there was an increased self-care and a greater engagement with the healthcare system. And so even despite the limited intervention and being in an integrated health system, we're optimistic that even this small intervention could help engage people in their own, in their own healthcare and managing their own pain. And many, many study participants saw this experience as a stepping stone. Um, here's one quote from one of our participants that said, I'm going to ask my doctor to refer me to the pain program that he's been trying to get me to go to for years. I'm thinking of these four weeks as a stepping stone. And so lastly, in addition to empowering the participants in our study, the experience of being in the study empowered the patient partners. Um, some of them have gone on to and be engaged in more patient-centered research after the study ended. And some of the curriculum that has also been adopted by some of our clinical stakeholders in the Kaiser system. So a quick shout out to all the researchers and all the collaborators and the patient partners. And lastly, we are one of the studies that have wound down and gone through the whole cycle of PCORI through our peer review. And at last, last week, our um, research summary was published on the PCORI website. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, our, our next speaker, our final panelist, is Dr. Um, David Gastfriend, who is an addiction psychiatrist and principal investigator of the PCORI funded PATH study. At Harvard, he directed Massachusetts General Hospital's addiction research program. He has American Society of Addiction Medicine, or ASAM Criteria Research, contributed to endorsement by most states. His 150 publications include the ASM Criteria and Addiction Treatment Matching and his continuum, the ASM Criteria Decision Engine, is being adopted nationwide. His co-founded um, co Dynamic Air Health, a technology for contingency management, won Harvard's Business School's New Venture Competition Global Grand Prize. He has served as a consultant to governments in Belgium, China, Iceland, Israel, Norway, Russia, and the United States. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, when we look at the patients who have not been able to diminish their opioid consumption and who end up with an opioid use disorder, uh, we see a very diverse population, and the treatments available to them are still way too limited and the utilization is way too low. And that is fostering a persistence of the epidemic even while prescribing has started to come under control. So the current practice is specialty counseling in community addiction treatment programs um, with detoxification from the opioids. There is a rising utilization of opioid-based medication treatments, OBOT, um, but the abstinence model remains dominant. And the problem with that is it's not the most effective approach. Um, there is increase in motivational enhancement therapy utilization, which is a patient-centered approach, but even that is limited in its efficacy in this population in the absence of integration with medication. The American Society of Addiction Medicine 
publishes criteria that says you need to have multidimensional assessment because so many different domains of need occur in this population and need to be cared for in an integrated fashion. So they specify six dimensions of withdrawal, biomedical problems, psychological problems, problems with readiness, relapse potential, and environmental needs. But by and large, the field of addiction treatment is aware of these criteria, but not yet really using them in any systematic fashion. And their point is to use the least intensive resources known to yield optimal outcomes, which is both respectful of patients' needs for effective treatment, but also resource limitations. So my colleagues at Public Health Management Corporation in Philadelphia, Dr. Adam Brooks, who's here in the room, um, conceptualized a personalized addiction treatment to health model. This was years ago, about five years ago now. And we were funded by PCORI with a large pragmatic study to randomize 800 patients comparing the PATH model to the community standard specialty addiction programs. And we decided to invoke a number of evidence-based treatments, and I've organized them here according to the vectors of a public health epidemic, which uh, starts with the agent. It's not a virus or a bacterium as a typical epidemic. It's the drugs of abuse, heroin, fentanyl now, and their congeners. So what modalities are evidence-based for addressing the problems of the agent? Well, we have several FDA-approved medication-assisted treatments, MAT. Uh, the agonist, uh, methadone, is uh, well-established for decades now. Partial agonist treatment with buprenorphine and their different formulations, sublingual and extended release, month-long and six-month-long implants. And although this is newer, there is a very solid evidence base for improvement in reducing overdose and death. Uh, we now have an antagonist approach, naltrexone, which can be administered not as a daily oral medication, which produces very poor adherence, but a extended re release injection that lasts for a month. And uh, two comparative effectiveness trials head-to-head uh, -head between extended naltrexone and buprenorphine show that uh, you get very similar outcomes if the patient su succeeds in starting on the medication. Contingency management is a very different approach, but it essentially is a physiologic response approach. It actually pays patients money for adherence and retention uh, and abstinence. Uh, and that addresses not the cortex of the brain, the outer brain here, but if you see in the host model of the brain, that pink region, which is representing the reward center. So contingency management works at a level below consciousness, directly at the reward center's function. But we also have to address consciousness and learning and changing behavioral patterns. And cognitive behavioral therapy is a well-established modality in general although not that effective by itself in addiction treatment after detoxification. So CBT is being used in combination with CM where we see the best results in the literature. Finally, the patient's interaction with their environment is critical in this disorder, and peer support has a lot of face validity and early evidence for being effective for that need. So I've just listed a whole bunch of different approaches and they're available here and there, sparsely, in the community, but in very disparate locations. And that fragmentation is absolutely the worst setup of service delivery for a disease that disrupts the patient's motivation to get well. So 90% of people with opioid use disorder don't seek care or get it. And the resources are limited when they want it. The access is, is sparse and their motivation is impaired, and society doesn't understand that disruption of motivation. The rest of us, when we get sick, we seek uh, wellness. We hurt, we want to enter the doctor-patient relationship. That's not the case for somebody in the throes of addiction. And the highly fragmented system needs to be essentially defragged. So the PATH model proposes to do that. Um, PATH is patient, uh, uh, personalized addiction treatment to health, and we are operating it 
in the study in federally qualified health centers, which have the ability to offer multidimensional assessment and evidence-based treatment with each of these components. So by defragging the system, invoking the primary care model, and offering long-term collaborative care, the hypothesis is that we should get as good or better outcomes than the specialty system. But when it comes time to advising patients and helping them make choices, it turns out to be really tricky in this disorder. For one thing, there's a tremendous range of variation among patients and their needs. They have different types of opioids that they use, prescription, heroin, or fentanyl. Um, there are different routes of administration, smoking, snorting, oral use, injection. Uh, patients with uh, youth are most common in the epidemic at the moment, but the fastest rising subgroup is the elderly with opioid use disorder. Chronicity and impact on the patient's level of function is a big issue. Uh, prior treatment experience and what phase of recovery is the patient in because that can change their potential interest and suitability for these different treatments and their combinations. If the patient has chronic pain, it substantially complicates how we're going to treat them in their opioid disorder. And it may not be just how much pain they objectively have, but what is their orientation to pain? Are they preoccupied with it? Are they obsessional about it? Co-occurring disorders of mood, anxiety, psychosis have big impacts on patients' ability to engage in these treatments and what treatments should be selected. And many patients with these disorders end up eventually with social chaos and disenfranchisement. And yet, when we offer them treatments, a number of them will say, I don't want to participate because I'm afraid about discontinuation. Going off these, some of these medications can involve withdrawal. And I hear that it can be difficult. So the literature really does not guide us on selection factors. And therefore, the best method or approach for selecting between these medication approaches, methadone, buprenorphine, or extended release naltrexone, may simply be patient preference based upon the features, the side effects, the way these medicines work. And so we need more evidence for how to guide initiation and how to guide termination decisions because another problem is adherence and persistence over time. We know that long-term treatment is most effective, but patients don't tend to stick with these medicines. So we have different models, harm reduction, which is permissive and engaging of as many patients at the moment that they are ready to talk as possible versus the recovery model, which is constraining and sets firm expectations for treatment participation and performance in terms of abstinence. Scheduled treatment versus flexible approaches. And how do you design a study that's going to offer flexible patient-centered approaches and yet not standardize what's being delivered? How do you do statistical comparisons when you have that model? Yet the be best basis seems to be patient preference for what we know now. We have completed a pilot phase of the study, and in the four FQHCs where we've operated the study, we have some substantial learnings, and they're, they're challenging. Um, one thing we find is that many buprenorphine wavered prescribers in this country who have the legal authority to prescribe this federally controlled substance don't prescribe. In fact, more people who have the waiver don't prescribe than are willing to prescribe. And induction for naltrexone is limited. There are protocols, but they're not being used. Group therapy and peer specialists are essential ingredients to successful outcome, but they're not reimbursed in many of the FQHC systems. Contingency management has federal um, HHS, Office of the Inspector General, policy obstacles. We are working on solutions for those, but they have inhibited our ability to get these studies started. Primary care tends to have behavioral care and is focused on short term, but we need to have a long term focus for this disease. And one thing I will say um, that I thank PCORI for its influence on uh, consumer input. Um, peer mediated street recruitment was recommended by our community advisory board and my co investigator, Andre Reed, and has doubled the rate of recruitment. So that's a very impressive um, outcome of introducing their input. There's a lot of opportunity for impact. Uh, FQHCs are numbering over 1,300 in the country. Um, one in 12 Americans has access to an FQHC. If we can show 
better outcomes with the PATH model in FQHCs or even similar outcomes. Similar outcomes would be great because then we could dramatically increase access to care. And that's the goal of the study. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of our panelists. So now we are um, going to turn the, the podium or the mics over to our, our two discussants, who I will um, introduce them both at the same time. And you're welcome to either remain seated or um, give your, your marks at, at the podium. So our first discussant is Dr. David Kelly, who oversees the clinical and quality aspects of Pennsylvania's medical assistance programs which provide health benefits to more than 2.5 million recipients. The Office of Medical Assistance Program's recent ac accomplishments include participating in a multi-payer medical home co collaborative, initiating pay-for-performance programs, and developing a multi-state application for the Medicaid Electronic Health Record Incentive Program. Previously, Kelly was the medical director responsible for utilization and quality management in Pennsylvania for Aetna Incorporated, served as assistant professor and director of clinical quality improvement at the Pennsylvania State University's College of Medicine, and practiced in multiple clinical settings. He is board certified in internal medicine and geriatrics. Our second discussant is Dr. Travis Reeder. Dr. Reeder is a philosopher by training and a bioethicist by profession. He writes and speaks on a variety of ethical and policy issues raised by prescription and illicit opioid use. This interest in opioids came about suddenly after a motorcycle accident, when Reeder took too many pills for too long and suddenly found himself with a profound dependency. In the wake of that experience, he became driven to discover why the practice of medicine struggles to deal with prescription opioids and how that problem is related to the broader drug overdose epidemic. He wrestles with those questions in several academic and popular publications, as well as in an upcoming book to be published in 2019 with HarperCollins, titled Pain in America. Thank you to our discussants. Thank you, and I'd like to thank Corey for inviting me to be part of this panel and part of this discussion. As the Chief Medical Officer for Pennsylvania Medicaid, uh, where we have done Medicaid expansion of over 700,000 individuals that previously had no health insurance, I will say that probably over 150,000 of those individuals now have been able to have benefits that include fairly comprehensive treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we face in Pennsylvania is we have a crisis. 13 Pennsylvanians die every day of opioid use disorder. That, to me, that is an emergency. And unfortunately, what we see too often is stigma throughout the community at the provider level, at law enforcement level, at the legislative level, I think we're starting to see some decrease in that stigma, but it's still there. What's vitally important really is the patient-centered approach that Corey brings to the table. And the research that you've heard about, I think, is vitally important to our Medicaid program. Uh, I will say that there are some programs that we've tried to do uh, over the last two or three years to address the opioid crisis. We've developed uh, centers of excellence uh, a model where there's a patient-centered, person-centered approach, where there are, we are paying for care management teams, including peer recovery specialists. Uh, we also um, are f uh, funding uh, other hub-and-spoke models uh, that have been published and other state Medicaid programs have used. We're really trying to disseminate that hub-and-spoke model. We're very much so expanding medication-assisted treatment. Uh, over the last five years, we've seen a large increase in the number of individuals that now uh, take advantage of both methadone, buprenorphine, as well as injectable naltrexone. We've seen our numbers go up significantly. We also have seen uh, a fairly good duration of treatment uh, for those individuals because we think that for folks to move towards recovery, you really have to uh, stay on, stay in tr your treatment course and move towards recovery. The patient-centered or person-centered approach is vital because uh, in the healthcare delivery model, one thinks of, or thinks in the context of medical care, 
and we know that everyone's lives focuses more than just the medical system and that social determinants of health, if they're ignored, uh, we're never going to come up with great solutions. Really need to be paying attention to not just the medical model of care, but all of those social determinants that affect our daily lives. And again, Pecori's approach is very person focused and takes into account all of those other variables that happen on a daily basis. Um, there are other programs that we've implemented. I'm not going to sit here and talk about them, uh, but I think the most important uh, message I have is we are in the middle of an opioid crisis. We need to be compassionate. We need to reduce stigma. We need to um, make sure that individuals that are on chronic opioids, usually no fault of their own, uh, that they need to be treated compassionately they need to be offered uh, innovative programs, some of which you've heard about. And from a Medicaid standpoint, at least in Pennsylvania, we're very open to uh, developing these, these new models of care that are very person focused. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and sh to be able to share my thoughts with you. Thanks. Um, well, if all you heard of my introduction is that I'm a philosopher, don't worry, I won't talk about any of that with my few minutes today. Um, I'm here mostly as a, as a patient and as a storyteller. Um, so I've been doing a lot of storytelling over the last few years, uh, ever since I had my motorcycle accident. And the reason I've been telling this story is uh, it's, a, it's a strange experience to be inducted into the healthcare system as a bioethicist. I'm a research faculty at Johns Hopkins. And um, it's a little surreal to kind of develop all this first personal knowledge of uh, the sorts of things that you might study in a, in a textbook. Um, so one of the things that I discovered is that opioid withdrawal is not like it is in the movies. Um, if you've ever seen someone go through heroin withdrawal in a movie, it's like a, a clip of shivering and sweating, and then the next clip is the next day, and thank God they're through that. Um, so I, uh, I ended up being put on high and escalating doses of opioids for very good reason. I had my foot blown apart uh, and, and many surgeries to put it back together. But the problem was um, nobody was looking out for me as I got passed through this very complex system from provider to provider, from hospital to hospital. And so at the end of, of months of this, uh, finally somebody looked at my chart and asked me about my meds and said, oh, that's, that's too many. Uh, we need to stop that now. And then the problem was that nobody knew how to do that. Um, so I, I really appreciate hearing people like Beth talk about explicitly, like, here's how we taper. Because um, one of the things you find out if you work, in, uh, work with clinicians all around in all different settings is that uh, everyone who has this DEA license who allows them, that allows them to prescribe opioids does not then know how to safely get a patient off of opioids. And one might think that would be a pretty reasonable principle to adhere to. If you can prescribe something, make sure you can deprescribe it. Um, but that's not a principle that has been internalized in medicine. And so a lot of what I do is not high bioethics. I go around and talk to clinicians and make that point. And they go, oh, yeah, that's a really good point. I wonder how we're going to do that. Um, and then there's the hard promise of, of um, establishing structures to allow that. So I don't have in just a couple of minutes time to give you the gory details. Um, but the points that I want to make well, and if you want them, you can go to my TED talk. I've, I've done the 14 minute version where I try to make you excruciatingly uncomfortable by describing what opioid withdrawal is like. Um, but at the end for me, I was in it for a month because my, my prescriber said, oh, drop a quarter of your dose each week and in four weeks you'll be done. And that was just about like the worst way to do it because it was an incredibly high decrease by percentage and by percentage it gets more each week. So I had terrible withdrawal that got worse each week, but it also lasted a whole month all right. Uh, so it was just about the worst of both worlds. And at the end of a month, I was actively contemplating suicide because I was in a very, very deep depression. Um, when I came out of this and I started thinking about it and reflecting on the issue, um, there was a there was this main idea that, you know, if you prescribe opioids, you really need to know what to do with them afterwards. Um, but in the context of what we've been hearing so far and about PCORI's uh, very nice kind of funding chart, I really appreciate Els putting up these four quadrants. Um, the one kind of point that I want to leave folks with today is 
we talk about responsible prescribing in the context of an opioid epidemic with the language of we need to decrease opioid prescribing. Um, and that's multiply problematic because decreasing isn't a good goal because patient-centeredness requires that you appropriately prescribe and sometimes that's less and sometimes that's not. The other problem is um, writing the script is this one moment in the prescribing relationship, right? And there's a whole bunch of other moments. And so some of that is counseling the patient beforehand and making sure they're ready for pain and so that they will rely on the medication less and that you have an exit strategy. And then a whole bunch of it happens afterwards. It's managing the patient and the prescription longer term to make sure that you can actually de-prescribe as appropriate. So here are two points on the, on the nice PCORI pathway of the four funding quadrants. You have, you know, um, prescribing and non-prescribing options. So that's upfront kind of supply reduction if, if we're oversupplying. And then there's management of long-term prescriptions and that's part of management. So um, uh, Beth's work in particular has, is really important for this, this population of legacy patients, some of who are orphan patients now without a prescribing doctor, um, because we need to de-prescribe people on hundreds of morphine milligram equivalents uh, of medication. Um, that's an important part of not contributing to the epidemic, making sure that people are on dangerously high doses, can safely and effectively, when they're ready, in, in a patient-centered way, reduce that prescription. But there's also this category in the middle, and that is routine deep prescribing. And that's what failed with me. And think about how often this happens. Every orthopedic surgery, every cesarean session, uh, uh, cesarean section, every um, routine surgery of every kind that requires at least a few days of opioid analgesia, right? Oftentimes we're over-prescribing anyway and sending them home with two weeks or three weeks, and that's bad. Um, but whether you're over-prescribing or prescribing appropriately, you have to make sure the patient has a way to get off the pills that you prescribe. So that's my time. Thanks very much. Happy to answer questions. All right, I want to thank all of our um, excellent panelists and discussants for um, for re really teeing up the what will happen next, which is a, a discussion with with all of you. So we, there are microphones in in the aisles on both sides of the room. I'd like to invite you to um, to come up with and comments and and questions. Um, we have just just almost a half an hour before um, before the session ends and. Thank you very much for this really uh, fascinating talk. Really, a lot of uh, practical points for both patients, practitioners, and patients um, and providers. So, my name is Maliha Ali. I'm with the American Institutes for Research. And I'm curious to know, especially for doctors Darnell and Gasparine, could you describe some of the barriers that you've seen working with providers on both? Um, providing treatment for opioid use disorder, and also with providing treatment or providing appropriate pain management. Uh, you did mention, Dr. Grasreen, that the majority of physicians who have buprenorphine waivers are not prescribing that. And I think this also, um, if you can tie that into how um, this could be linked to stigma and within the delivery system. Thank you. Yeah, the reason we think that most of the physicians, uh, and I'm talking about many thousands of physicians across the country who've been wavered but won't prescribe, uh, seems to be, the, one, the concern that they really don't know how to do it, and if they get into trouble, they don't know where to turn. It's a partial agonist, so it has some challenging issues of initiation and dose management. Um, but the bigger problem, I suspect, is fear that they will become a magnet for difficult uh, to treat um, patients who will alter the climate of their waiting room and scare off their other patients. Now, Vermont and other states, you just heard Pennsylvania is doing this, have developed a hub and spoke model where the specialty hubs initiate the patient, stabilize the patient, provide um, the psychosocial grounding uh, in the, for the context of the medication, and then they transfer the patient's direct care to primary care in the community where a provider gets 
um, wa wavered and has support from the specialists day to day, week to week, month to month, and feels that they won't be left adrift and they're getting a patient who's already stabilized. So that's a very fruitful model for overcoming this problem. And I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that Pennsylvania is making use of that and other states as well. But it, it's, it's a big problem in getting access. Thank you for the, the question. Can, can you hear me okay? Um, so uh, I have two uh, different aspects to my response. The first is that the first main uh, barrier is education. Um, so veterinarians receive 28 hours of pain education and training. Physicians receive between four and 11 hours across four years of medical school. So uh, the physicians that enter our communities are ill-prepared to manage the complexities of people. They're trained to deal with symptoms, to write prescriptions. Um, so that's number one. And, and we could extend this across professions. It's not just physician training. It's physical therapists. It's psychologists. Psychologists receive zero pain education systematically throughout training. And so that's a lost opportunity to address the psychosocial dimensions because there's huge comorbidity comorbidity between pain and mental health conditions. Um, so that's number one, is uh, education is needed. Travis also uh, re referred to the fact that once a prescription is started, um, you know, physicians and prescribers lack the education for how to de-prescribe. But the second piece to my response is that there are barriers in terms of resources. So we can train physicians, we can train healthcare clinicians, and they could say, great, I want to um, prescribe self-management or psychological approaches or an interdisciplinary approach. And then what we find is that there's barriers to accessing these evidence-based treatments. So we can develop all the best treatments in the world, but if our patients can't access them, it means squanto. So we need better uh, allocation of resources towards education and also models of delivery, you know, of, of care models that are truly accessible. And I believe that this will um, eventually come down to some of these more um, internet-based uh, approaches as a front line, and that was discussed in this session. That's where some of my work is focusing as well, because we've got to transition send the current issues uh, around proximity and also education. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next so, question. Um, Kevin Haynes, I'm a, a pharmacist and an epidemiologist. I'm the PI of a health plan research network. I wanted to talk about the data gaps in being able to close these gaps in evidence. So, very much, I'm also a resident of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, so very excited to, to hear all the work that's being done there. When you have state prescription drug monitoring programs that, that have real rich exposure data, but then you have administrative claims, Medicaid, commercial claims, Medicare claims, that have the rich outcome data that cross and transcend healthcare systems. So in other words, if I get a prescription because of a surgery at Penn, at HUP, at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania, but I have an opioid overdose thing at Temple, there's so much fragmentation in the healthcare system and health plans are trying to provide care management, health systems are trying to provide care management. So we need to link the, the data, and I'm finding it incredibly challenging for health plans to link into this high quality exposure data because we're missing the cash paid prescriptions and we're doing a disservice. We can't really provide high quality care or high quality uh, evidence generation without data linkage. So I wonder what the panel and especially Dr. Kelly with regards to from a state perspective as, as well on the need for data linkage to close gaps in evidence to ultimately close gaps in care. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, unfortunately, in Pennsylvania, we, we have an excellent PDMP that's been operationalized over the last two years, and I think that uh, overall prescribing of opiates is down, I'm going to say, at least 10 or 12 percent, and there's been a significant reduction. In, providers are using it, and there's been a significant reduction in individuals that uh, are shopping from provider to provider. But with that being said, unfortunately, the law does not allow us, even as, as a Medicaid agency, I can go in and look at it and I can look at on a case-by-case -case basis. I can't push that data or that information to our health plans. We also, we have a lot of claims data and we actually have worked with the University of Pittsburgh to develop a, a, an overdose predictive model 
for who, was, who will have the next overdose. And we ran that across our claims data and I was told I could not push that out to our managed care plans because of our state confidentiality regulations. So we did give that model uh, to our health plans and said, go do it yourself. So there are some barriers out there, unfortunately. Um, we're trying to break some of those barriers down. There, there was, uh, I believe, a bill uh, that was circulating in our assembly uh, to actually have our managed care plans get access uh, to the PDMP uh, information. Uh, so there are some challenges. On the other hand, um, putting on the hat of, of, a, of a consumer and a patient, uh, the confidentiality laws are there for a reason. There is a lot of stigma. There's a lot of discrimination. Uh, we've seen it, especially in the past, with HIV patients. We're continuing to still see that uh, with opiate use disorder. So I understand it is a balancing act, but I think there, it would be nice if we could break down some of these walls where we could judiciously share information that's going to help patients and not harm them. Yeah, and I would add that um, if we could get national data harmonization really working with PDMP and um, uh, privacy uh, law work through to allow the data sharing that you're calling for, um, we'd still have the problem of physicians taking the active role of checking the PDMP prior to prescribing and prior to refilling. And um, we could get a lot of help if the Joint Commission would undo the damage it had done when it invoked the requirement that you check pain as the fifth vital sign, um, and, which was um, uh, destructive because suddenly every doctor uh, working in a healthcare system was obligated to ask, essentially, is your pain zero? Because if your pain's not zero, I should be prescribing some opioids for you. And that's inevitably what happened. And we're gonna, have, we're gonna be paying for that for another decade. Um, the Joint Commission could require the um, percentage of times a, a prescription of an opioid in the EHR record is associated with a check of the PDMP. It's a simple, uh, almost trivial electronic um, uh, uh, programming task. And so we could actually be reporting, and obviously every physician under those systems would then do it. Um, and it wouldn't have to be uh, an active act. It could be a passive reminder to the physician. So it needs to be incentivized that physicians um, use the care and caution that's required in this kind of an epidemic. Great, thank you. Next question. Thank you. My name is David Ivgi. I'm the founder of MCN. It's a national care coordination and telemedicine network. And the reason I came today, I want to hear from distinguished panel and as well as maybe the audience, how to implement that com ongoing communication between providers and patients regarding the opioid use after the treatment has been done on an ongoing basis. And if there is, I mean, practical ways how to do that, what do you think could be the, those uh, methods? And second, if there is currently any way to reimburse the providers for that extra time, which is ongoing, as I said. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, we do not have sort of an aftercare component in um, our PCORI funded study and the EMPOWER study where we're following people for one year and they get our behavioral treatments and they're slowly reducing their opioids. Um, but one of the um, one of the pathways under consideration, and we deliberated about this, um, was to integrate in uh, peer support groups from the American Chronic Pain Association. These are free peer support groups that are provided around the United States. So you can go to the acpa.org website and, and learn about them. They're not, this is not specific to opioid use disorder. This is specific to self-management of chronic pain. And there was just through the vagaries and complexities of research, it was not a good fit for our current study 
study, um, but we do offer that in uh, at the Stanford Pain Management Center and throughout the United States. And what's nice about it is it's free. So the only burden is for the um, the host to provide space. The ACPA helps identify peers in the community who uh, become leaders and support others through uh, better management of pain. But as far as the opioid use disorder, I would uh, defer to the other panelists. Thank any, other, any further comments? Go ahead. As a payer uh, for telemedicine, I would say that um, Pennsylvania Medicaid, we have policies in place where we would pay for uh, telemedicine done in, on an outpatient basis, and we've uh, told our providers that that is something we're willing to re reimburse for. Uh, it's the typical uh, billing requirements through uh, an E&M code. It is available. Uh, we, we feel that the DEA uh, earlier this year gave guidance that uh, brought down some barriers uh, for doing MAT via telemedicine. Uh, so it is something that uh, within the Commonwealth, we have already put the policy infrastructure in place to make that available. One of the issues, though, is that from a counseling standpoint, um, because we are very restrictive in Pennsylvania, you can't get drug and alcohol related counseling unless you physically go to a drug and alcohol counseling treatment center. So it's a huge barrier, and uh, so even from a telemedicine standpoint, there are barriers to having that counseling portion of medication-assisted treatment done via telemedicine. Now, there's some caveats. We, we always feel that that face-to-face -face connection is the most important, and we don't really want to see telemedicine replace that face-to-face, -face, but there's some rural areas where access is more of an issue, and certainly we would advocate that uh, folks could use telemedicine, but we really don't want it to totally replace that face-to-face -face connection that we think is vital uh, with providers. Great, thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Helen Burstrom with the Council of Medical Specialty Societies. I'm also on the steering committee of the newly launched National Academy of Medicine's uh, collaborative to counter the opioid epidemic. And the reason I want to mention this, you, you've brought up so much rich research findings that are coming out of this. The collaborative is really all about a public-private partnership to address and implement some of these findings. So I think there's a real opportunity for us to think about where can a public-private partnership, at least initially, our workers will be focused on education and training, um, prescribing guidelines and standards, um, as well as prevention, treatment, and recovery with a cross-cutting emphasis on both research and stigma, to your earlier point, David. So we just welcome your thoughts about where you see the, the critical linkage between this incredibly important research and how we actually can think about implementation rapidly to address the epidemic using a really unique public-private partnership with health systems, public health systems, all at the table together. Yeah, I'll say something about that. Uh, one of the remarkable things about PCORI funding that is so different from NIH funding is that in our study, we were funded for a dissemination phase after the main trial. So just to do an 800 um, patient, you know, randomized comparative effectiveness study is, is remarkable enough. But then to have another year of funding to disseminate the results and to have a stakeholder um, steering committee from the inception of the you know, protocol development to bring together um, uh, professional societies, um, patient advocacy groups, um, provider trade associations, uh, funders um, in, in the oversight of a study from start to finish. That's something that you only get in a PCORI type of project. So I think what you said is really important and I'm really grateful um, because it stretches the researchers to realize that they're not done when they publish the paper. Right, and, and, and maybe just to add to that, I think in addition to the implementation, and I know Corey does a great job with that piece of it, there's an effort here to try to scale it as well. So how do you move beyond what you've learned and think about how you scale it at a national level, which is really where I think the, part, the collaborative would, would, would like to emphasize. I'm sure David has something to... So at least at the state level, we would certainly uh, be uh, willing to look at a lot of the research that's been done here to disseminate 
and um, especially when it comes to uh, payment models and especially working with our FQHCs, we have a great network of FQHCs in, in Pennsylvania. We've already had some discussions at the statewide level to really more widely implement MAT within our FQHCs and to do it in, with a high fidelity model. We're already putting payment mechanisms in place for uh, some of the care management. It gets a little tricky because of how FQHCs are reimbursed, but we certainly would want to disseminate those findings. I think the findings around how to treat uh, chronic pain in a multidisciplinary mode. We're already moving. Uh, Geisinger Health Systems already put together in, in two sites in rural areas, and the Allegheny Health Network System in Pittsburgh have put together these multidisciplinary outpatient pain management uh, uh, clinics that hopefully uh, have been very person focused. So we really want to see the dissemination of. Uh, those models, but we've tried to expand. Uh, we allow our managed care plans to pay for acupuncture. We, we pay for chiropractic. Uh, we've reduced prior authorization requirements on non-opioids. Uh, so we've tried a whole host of things, but we're, the state at least, is very much so interested in being able to disseminate these concepts. I think nationally, uh, our Medicaid medical directors are here this week. Uh, for the next two days, rather, to um, talk about the opioid crisis and other topics. And one of the things that we're going to have discussions around is how do we, how do all of my counterparts, and there are 46 states that will be meeting, that will be represented, how do we disseminate these things, not just in the state of Pennsylvania, but in these other state Medicaid programs. So we're very much so interested in taking what this research shows us in disseminating it, and especially in state Medicaid programs. So I'd just like to um, add to that, that uh, while there's a huge emphasis on treating pain better, one of um, the key foci is how do we help these 18 million Americans who are currently taking prescribed opioids and reduce their use. So we really need solutions urgently because there have been, um, there has been advice from the CDC and other agencies to reduce opioid prescribing and physicians and prescribers in the communities are not trained to implement this and it puts our patients at risk yet again when we're not tapering the right mm -hmm. way. So I believe that part of this private um, partnership um, what we need to be focusing on is developing online implementation strategies that use best practices. There are physician portals, prescriber portals, also has a patient-facing um, website and resources so that we can rapidly scale and address the needs of Americans today, not a decade from now or a decade and a half when medical education catches up with what's happening right now. I also would like to add, um, thank you, David, for mentioning the PCORI emphasis on dissemination. We, we do, as a, one of the criteria for review, we look at um, what, what is the disseminatability, I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> of, of this intervention, should it show effectiveness, and also how scalable is it? And, and if the answers to those are, well, probably not gonna happen, then that really kind of stops the whole process. Great, thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Katina Lang Lindsay, and I am a kidney transplant patient. I'm a part of the ambassador program here. And also, I am on a study uh, uh, called putting patient, it's a PCORI study, putting patient at the center of kidney care. But also, I am a professor at Alabama State University in social work department. And my, I don't think I have a question, but I think I have more of a consideration. And my consideration is, have you considered social workers as being persons to help with the psychosocial uh, components of what you're doing and the reason why is because clinical social workers have clinical social workers who are able to play more than one role in the whole capacity. Um, we both can help with the psychosocial 
then we also can help with the resources. That serves, that serves its own entity. But not only that, we are able to build at the clinical level and be able to help. So we are a resource that can be used. And I think sometimes it's, it's unfortunate that we do not get an opportunity to be used. And I think that's a, bit, a big part, too, as it relates to being a part of the multidisciplinary team is that if you will uh, consider that aspect, and I think it will be helpful. Also, my last comment is in regards to telemedicine. Um, a colleague and I are working towards now telemedicine, uh, use, uh, mental health in rural communities. And that's one of the things that I believe that we could also be used in because we also, I know that um, we could also be used in that area in terms of billing. I, I think in with the federal um, community health centers, we could also be a, uh, an asset to them in getting those mental health services that otherwise cannot be getting for those persons that are in rural areas. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have time for one, one final question or comment. Thank you. Um, Jia Singh, University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, clinician researcher. Um, very nice presentations. My questions are um, frequently, and I think as one of the discussants brought up, uh, after elective surgery or surgery in general, patients get two or three weeks of pretty good doses of uh, for opioid medications, and then they're left right there either to seek that back from their primary care physicians and or figure out how to get them off. Now, we know that the training of clinicians is limited with regards to opioid prescription. So has the, what are your thoughts about what sort of models, because here's a challenge about inadequate knowledge, transition of care, major surgery, you know, patient grappling with all these things, and so is the system, and there is transition of care occurring. A good example is, you know, joint replacement surgery, one million knees done in the US in the elderly population, primarily two thirds of them, and they all get opioids, and some of them have never seen opioids, and others have had that experience. So what do you think, what sort of model might work with this transition of care opioid prescription um, challenge? So I, I have a couple of studies that are targeting this exact issue right now. They're not funded by PCORI. Um, but what they involve is training the, the uh, unit staff, the physicians and the nurses, on how to talk to people about pain and how to address pain non-pharmacologically. That's not to the exclusion of opioid medication, it's equipping patients and providers with the information for how to treat pain multimodally and how to empower patients to go home and reduce reliance on the opioids that they may have used in the hospital. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is we've developed uh, behavioral, digital behavioral medicine treatment Treatments so that when a patient goes to surgery, we can characterize their needs and we can deploy an email to them that includes an, a behavioral pain medicine intervention, which they can receive before surgery or after surgery. So these are some scalable options that we're focusing on. Great. Dr. Reeder, did you want to make one final com make yeah. our final comment? Yeah, one quick thing. Um, so I've worked with a couple of hospitals on this sort of question, and so one private hospital is an orthopedic surgery hospital, and one of the things we learned really quickly is, so one, it all has to be contextual, so what works at Johns Hopkins, which is hugely different from the specialized orthopedic surgery hospital, they're not going to work in the same way. And the other thing is, um, it's not clear that there'll be any one right answer, but it has to be addressed structurally, right? And so in this orthopedic surgery hospital, one of the things we talked about was training NPs and PAs who do a lot of the discharge prescribing to uh, do the sort of um, exit strategy mapping, follow-up care, the having scripted conversations that can identify behavioral health assessment needs, that sort of thing. But it's not clear that that's the only solution. It's what would work for them given that orthopedic surgeons are not gonna be spending their time doing this, right? Um, so. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much to our, our speakers. Once again, a, a round of applause for our speakers and to all of you in the audience for participating today.